this, I want you to notice the Bible, the worth of the Bible. Read it with me. Though the cover is worn and the pages be torn, and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide, tis a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while possessing this blessing divine. That is the word of God. And we're going to become accustomed to that little bit of poetry in connection with our Bible. Matthew chapter 20, we want to begin reading in verse 20. Where we left off last Sunday morning, the Bible says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, You shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to set on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called, un, called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. I want to speak to you this morning on the way to greatness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray you'd add your blessings to the reading, the preaching of your word this morning. We're thankful for the principles that we can learn from this event in the life of you and your disciples. Lord, I pray that we would seek not our own greatness, but the greatness of your name. For Lord, you alone are worthy to receive it all. I pray, Father, that today you would just speak to our hearts in a very special way and let those who are here today receive a blessing from your word. We ask these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And you may be seated. If you want to put your finger in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the parallel passage for this is found in Mark's Gospel, Mark 10, verses 35 through 45. Neither Luke nor John record this incident. As a matter of fact, while you're there at Luke, we'll go, I mean in Mark, go ahead and let's look at this. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 10 and verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. We will address this in a moment, but if you read Mark and Matthew's account, Mark does not even mention the mother of these boys, these young men, these men. It's not a contradictory account, it's a complementary account. And what we see is when you combine the two accounts, that here we have James and John and their mother, and we'll talk more about her in a few moments. But they've had some discussion, and they all go to Jesus together. And Jesus asks, what do you need? What do you want? And she speaks up, and she gives the request. Simply that, James would be able to sit on one side of Christ in his kingdom and John would sit on the other 
when he sets up his earthly kingdom. And of course, you know the response that Jesus gave. He said, that's not mine to give. Now, what we see here is not anything new. Go back with me to chapter 18 of Matthew. Chapter 18. Verse 1, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Mark tells us that they had been arguing over who was the greatest. Which one of them was going to be the greatest in the coming kingdom? So it's, this is not anything new where they are, as it were, vying for position. They were following, I'm certain, what was the cultural procedures of the day like it is our day. And these events take place as the Lord and his disciples are make. We know from verse 29 they're getting ready to make their way from Jericho to Jerusalem because in verses 17 through 19 God had told them for the third time, the Lord Jesus told them, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be mocked and scourged and whipped and spit upon, then I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be dead. But don't worry, three days later I'm going to rise back up again and it's going to be okay. We preached on that last Sunday. And the disciples are still using, using human reasoning and they're saying, well, if there's a coming kingdom, I want to make sure I get my spot. Yeah. Now, this is nothing new in our culture today, is it? I remember back in 1978, before the majority of you all that are here this morning were probably born, but a fellow, by the, a fellow by the name of Robert Ringer wrote a best-selling book. It stayed on top of the New York Times bestsellers list for a number of weeks. And it was entitled this, Looking Out for Number One. And it was basically a motivational book on how to, get, how to climb your way to the top and how to claw your way to the top if need be. And, you know, there's an adage that says, if you don't blow your own horn, nobody else is going to blow it for you, so you better blow loud. And that's kind of where that's kind of where the disciples are. I mean, they know this kingdom's coming. They want to make sure that they have jockeyed for positions, and they've been arguing about it. And of course, back in Matthew 18, when they're arguing about it, Jesus sets a bunch of children in front of them and uses them as examples of what, how you get your place in the kingdom. Chapter 19, he reiterates it because they bring some children to him, and he does the same thing again. Chapter 19, the latter part of chapter 19, after the encounter with the rich young ruler, Peter looks at him and says, all right, what's in it for us? And, and it's all about what do I get out of serving God? Now let me tell you what happens when we serve God out of what's in it for me attitude. First of all, you find yourself like David. David said in the third, 73rd Psalm, he said, I have washed my hands in vanity. He said, this has all been a waste. He said, because I'm doing the right thing, and they're not, and they get all the good stuff in life. That's Psalm 73. And, and he said, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. He said, I know, until I got things in right perspective, and as I was reading, matter of fact, I, you, you, you're going to have to turn back there with me. I didn't plan on including this. But look with me in verse, uh, go, go back with me to the book of Job in the Old Testament Bible. Job said it before, Dave, before David had ever written Psalm 73, Job had spoken the similar words. Job had spoken these similar words in the book of Job, the 24th chapter. And I remember Job is a man who's lost everything. And I mean, he's lost all of his children, he's lost all of his finances, he's lost everything. He is, he's lost his health. He's down to nothing but sitting in a pile of ashes and scraping his sores and dogs licking him. And he has three well-meaning friends that have come and told him obviously how wicked he must be for God to be doing this to him. Earlier this week I posted a, a, a post on Facebook. I said I had an epiphany in the 22nd chapter of Job. As a matter of fact, just look over there. This all will fit in, I promise you. Eliphaz is speaking, Job 22 and verse 23. Job, uh, Eliphaz is speaking to Job. He says, if thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. You'll get your health back. Verse 24, then thou shalt lay up gold as dust. Verse 25, the Almighty shall be thy defense and thou shalt have plenty of silver. In other words, get right with God and you get your health back and you get a lot of wealth added to it. And then look down in verse 28, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established to thee. 
Name it and claim it. Speak the word and you get the work. That's not a new philosophy. That's as old as the book of Job. That if you serve God, you get health and wealth and name it, claim it, and it's all yours. We have chapter, Job chapter 23 and Job is speaking and he says, I've looked everywhere for God and I can't find him. But I do know this, he knows the way that I take. Amen. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I may not have any, but I'll be gold myself. Amen. And then he comes to chapter 24. Why? Seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty. Do they that know him not see his days? Some remove the landmarks. In other words, they are dishonest in their business dealings. They violently take away flocks and feed thereof. They drive away the ass of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox. And he goes ahead and he goes all the way through this chapter. And I was reading and I thought, wow, David must have had his inspiration for Psalm 73 right here. Because Job was written before David was ever born. He must, he must have received it because they are almost saying the same thing. You know, I serve God and what does it get me? Nothing but heartache, toil, and trouble. Well, I read somewhere in a book, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yes, Amen. Let's go back to Matthew now. You say, how does that fit the context? Well, that's what was going on here. The disciples were trying to jockey for position in the kingdom. And it's in this setting that Jesus reveals more truth about those things that should characterize the people who follow him and those who desire a place in his coming glory. I want us to look, first of all, at verses 20 through 23, the request, their request to the Savior. I want you to notice... Three things about the request. Notice, first of all, the approach. It says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children. Why didn't he just say Zebedee's wife? Well, most likely by this time, Zebedee's already passed away. Men typically did not live long lives back in, there, in, in those days. Yeah, and um, they, because um, they, they, their work took their life a lot of times. And, but here she is, and they come and they're worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. So I want you to notice their approach was, first of all, was, was one of worship. Now, when she came to him, now, by the way, let me just back up a little bit about uh, this, their mother, James and John's mother. Mark mentions a lady by the name of Salome twice in the latter chapters of the Gospel of John. Now, there's about an 80% chance or better. There's, uh, most scholars do agree that this problem, that Sal Salome, is probably the mother of James and John. That You can't be dogmatic on it, but it's, a, it's a, a strong possibility. And if so, that makes her Mary's sister, because they were sisters. Now, Mary, the mother of Jesus. That would make her, this woman here, the aunt of Jesus Christ. Now, that would make James and John cousins. Now, and I say all that, it's most likely accurate because it was, family business was family business, especially back then, and they stayed with the family, and brothers and sisters, uh, brothers worked together, and cousins worked together, and they did all that, and they were all fishermen. Now, why am I saying that? Because it was not normal, especially in this culture of this day, for a woman to go up and speak to a man that she was not related to, especially a man of Jesus' reputation as a master, a rabbi, a teacher. And so Jesus, you know, Jesus, uh, he's sitting there and here she comes and she is going to ask a question, but they come and worship, the Bible says, they come worshiping him. Amen. They were acknowledging who he was. Can I tell you that if you want anything from the Lord Jesus Christ, you need more than a casual acquaintance with him Amen. to ask anything of him. Now, we know that God answers prayers. We know that the Lord wants to hear and answer our prayers. We know that we have not because we ask not. But the prayer life of most people today is a one-way conversation that is a convenience conversation opportunity conversation. Lord, I've got a need. Can you kind of help me out on this right now? And I'll let you know when I when I got another need. That's kind of the can I tell you that kind of prayer life will not ever see prayers answered. Now you say, but I pray like that and I don't because I don't know a whole lot about worship, but I get my do, do you understand God's not the only one who answers prayers? 
Do you understand that sometimes there's the natural circumstances of life bring things about, but also the devil will answer your prayers if it keep get your attention off of God? How about that? You say, can you prove that from the Bible? I can prove it from the Bible exactly. The temptation of Jesus. The devil promised several blessings to Jesus if he would just do this. Amen. And so what I'm trying to tell you here, if you want to have a meaningful prayer life where the Lord says, what do you, look, what do you want like he did here? And you, and you want him to hear you, you need to come and worship him. Folks, most people today, there's a lot of people in churches across our city and across our nation today. But few of them will ever be a part of a worship service today. A worship service is where we come and we acknowledge him for who he is. And can I tell you today, and I don't mean to sound like you, you have to be boring when you go to the house of God, but you listen to the conversations when people go to the house of God and the things of God are the last thing on their mind. Yes. They're talking about what they did yesterday, what they're going to do the next week, and they, they come in very little talking about the things of God, talking very little about scripture that they read this week, talking li very little about what God gave them out of his word this week. Why? Because they spent no time in the word. Oh, they might have did their daily Bible reading, but they did not no meditation. They did no study. God didn't speak to them. God didn't give them anything. Oh, they got a little depressed this week, and so they read Psalm seventy-three and got the one. I mean, Psalm twenty-three and got the warm fuzzies. That don't do anything for your prayer life. If you're going to have a meaningful, if you want, if you want to move into greatness with God, you have to start by worshiping at His feet. That's where Mary found herself. Every time you find Mary in the Bible, she's at the feet of Jesus. And she did some things that God said would be remembered for her from now on. I wonder sometimes, does the Lord, even though we've been in his presence or tried to be in his presence, he said, the Lord knows all about me. He knows all about us. But when was the last time he could give a record of you and him sitting down together, being close to each other, being intimate with one another and you worshiping him and not coming with your wish list of wants, but just saying, God, I just thank you for who you are. Amen. 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 The attitude of worship, but the appeal of petition, look again. And they, they came worshiping and desiring. That word desiring is the Greek word iteo. It's the Greek word that simply means to be asking of. It's a word that is often referred to as prayer throughout the New Testament. And how true that is. You know, a lot of times, <clears throat> we don't want to bother God with the small details of our life. He couldn't really be that interested in us. Can I tell you the Lord's interested in every avenue of your life? Amen. Can I tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you and everything, and He loves every... He wants to know the. He wants to know that you want to, him to be a part of every avenue of your life. He knows all about you. There's nothing that you can think that he doesn't know that you were going to think before you thought it. Amen. Amen. The Bible says twice that I know of. I know your thoughts. Thing is, he knew them before I had them. Right, right. He knew what thoughts. <clears throat> There's times when I say, Lord, I wish you'd stop that one from getting there. Amen. Their approach. But notice number two, I want you to notice in verse 21, and there is this request of the Savior, I want you to notice the appeal. They came to him and said, What wilt thou? And in verse 21, she said, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand, the other on the left, in thy kingdom. Now, I know many people have taken this poor lady to task for being a part of such a plot to promote her sons. You can look in Matthew's account and you can look in Mark's account and you will not find one reproof or one rebuke from the Savior. He does uh, even hint that she's doing wrong by asking. You say, preacher, what does that mean for me? Well, it means this. Don't be afraid of asking for the wrong thing because if, God, if you ask for the wrong thing, God knows how to make it straight, but he's he just glad you ask. I think of Paul in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
There was given to me a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh. And for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that he would remove it. And God says to him, My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen? Amen? God did not get on to Paul for asking for the wrong thing. He just said, Trust me with this one. That you can't ask God for the wrong thing. He just wants you to ask. Now, if it's the wrong thing, you just won't get it. And he'll let you know. But here she came and she's asking. And two things stand out about this to me that I don't know if you've noticed her. First, first of all, it's, it's an evidence of two things. Her, her appeal is evidence of two things. First of all, of her love. Her love for her children. Uh, can I, can I, you say, what, how does that fit in? It's always appropriate to talk about a mother's love. And you say, well, here she is, and she's rather arrogant, is it? No, no, no. She'd been hanging around with the Lord. Let me go ahead and give you the second thing, evidence, so I can tie this all together. Not only the evidence of her love, but it was the evidence of her faith. She's asking, she said, one to sit on the right, one to sit on the left, when thou come into thy kingdom. Now, Jesus, she had just heard the Lord Jesus finish saying, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And I'm going to, don't worry, I will rise again the third day. In all of Salome's life, of all of this lady's life, she had never, ever, under any circumstance, read about, heard about, or seen anybody come back from the dead. There was no reason for her to believe that that was going to happen. And yet, her faith speaks volumes here. She's, it's like Jesus has said, all right, I'm going to go to Jerusalem where I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be mocked and scourged and spit upon and crucified, and the third day I'm going to rise again. And, so, and she goes, okay, all right, once that's over, can my boys have a place in your kingdom? Amen. Her faith never stumbled. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you one of the reasons why you and I can have a hard time finding a, a close relationship with God is because we don't believe that he's able to do what he says he will do. We don't believe that it will come through. We don't, hey, and yet Jesus more than once said, if you will have faith as of a grain of mustard seed, you could move mountains. This woman never flinched. Now when I say about her love, so here she is talking to Jesus and, and she says, when they come into the kingdom, that shares, shows me, she had been around them long enough that out, no, to, out of the twelve, there was an inner circle of three. Peter and James and John. Her sons made up two-thirds of the inner circle. So when Jesus set up his kingdom and every king, you go all the way through the Old Testament, you can find more, more than once where kings had somebody on their right hand, somebody on their left hand. They were places of honor and position and prestige and power. And she thought, well, if there's two out of three, I don't want Peter getting one. It wouldn't be fair if James got one and John didn't. And so she goes and asks Jesus, just make sure they both get a place right there on your right and left hand side. I can admire her for that. She's, she doesn't want one boy to be offended or hurt his feelings. Now, Jesus never rebuked her for that. She, she had never, Jesus knew her heart. She had not doubted his pending resurrection at all. Matter of fact, she had more faith than James and John and the other ten did because they still didn't get it. Remember when they're in the Garden of Gethsemane? They're trying to stop it from happening. Her, here, it's a, it's a done deal. She knows, all right, that's going to happen. Then the kingdom, and now we're going to... She had, she had no, no doubts about what was taking place. Yet Peter, James, and John, and the other nine still didn't get it. Here was a woman that obviously, obviously displayed more faith in what Jesus said than the twelve did. What a, what a blessing. Remember, she had heard Jesus say in chapter 19, verse 28, when Peter had asked, uh, what's in it for us? Jesus said, I want to tell you. Let me, let me just read it to you. Chapter 19 is right there. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the, th shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones. She remembered that. She said, well, there's going to be twelve thrones. I, I, I want to pick which seat my two boys sit in. What a blessing. Amen? Amen? Here's a woman that was showing great faith. Probably more faith than most of us show today. We go to Jesus with a request and we're already, as we go to him in prayer and asking him for it, we're already in the back of our mind, we've got a backup plan when the prayer don't get answered. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? 
for John and James's mother, this was already a done deal. There was going to be 12 thrones. Jesus was going to die. He's going to rise again. He's going to set up a kingdom of 12 thrones. And she, all she was doing is asking for the places that her voice said. She, would, she didn't doubt it was going to happen. Like I said, that's more faith than what the other, than what the 12 had. Amen. So we see the approach, the appeal, but now look at the answer in verse 23, 22 and 23. Here's the Lord's response. Jesus looks at him and says, here's a question you ought to have highlighted in your Bible. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I shall be baptized with. Jesus simply asked them the question, can you do it? Now, don't read that statement lightly. I want to remind you that going through the scriptures, you find that to drink the cup. Here, I have a glass of water. I can say, all right, I'm just going to drink this cup of water. Everybody, everybody says, all right, go ahead. But biblically speaking, there was much more involved. Do you remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying his prayer? He said, Lord, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What was he talking about? The cup that he was about to drink of meant experiencing the full of experience of all that it involves. And the Lord turns to these guys and now he's addressing James and John. And he says, are you able to experience everything that I'm about to go through? Now, let me ask you, when was the last time you saw a recruitment poster for Christianity? And the test to join was, are you able to suffer? That's what Jesus is asking here. When he asked them, are you able? He was asking them, do you have the power? Do you have the ability? The word translated able is the Greek word dunamis. We get our English word dynamite from it. It's the same word when Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel, the very same word here. Do you have that ability? Do you have the power within you to be able to go through and suffer? That's the reason why Paul could write, he said, I have counted everything that I achieved in life all but dung, so that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Notice the disciples' response. They said, we're able. Sure. Jesus said, can you? They said, yes, we can. William Hendrickson in his commentary said, they forgot that a prayer for glory is a prayer for suffering. In other words, that it is the way of the cross that leads home. How true it is. Paul said you can't separate glory from suffering. If you remember back a few months ago or a couple years ago, and I guess now we went through the book of 1 Peter. And 1 Peter was written to a group of suffering saints. And the word suffer, some form of that word suffer is used 13 times in the book of 1 Peter. And yet I've discovered as I was studying that there's another word. It's some form of the word glory is used 13 times. For every time of suffering, there's a time of glory that can be attacked. And that's a Bible principle. Paul said it, and Jesus is saying it here. Amen? Well, so if you're suffering, just understand glory somewhere in view. Amen? Amen? They, the disciples' response, but I want you to notice in verse 23 again, notice the Lord's reply. They, Jesus said, can you? They said, we, we are. We're able and Jesus said, you will. He said, you shall, you shall drink of it. And you will be baptized with it. You know what they didn't know right then? Was Jesus was foretelling the martyrdom of James. James. James, the one that was standing there, was going to be put to death for the cause of Christ. He was going to, he was going to drink the cup in full. John, his brother, that was standing there, one day in the not so distant future, he is going to be exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And the only reason why he's exiled to the Isle of Patmos is because they couldn't kill him. They burned him, they boiled him in oil, and he wouldn't die. 
They boiled him in oil trying to kill him and he wouldn't die. Yes, John. James, you're going to drink the cup that I drink. You're going to die for me. As I die for you, you're going to die for me. John, you're going to be baptized, be baptized with the suffering that, I've gone, that I'm going through. And then he gives the Father's restriction. He said, but to do what you guys are asking to do, I don't have that authority. And we learn here about the sovereignty of God again, just like we did last Sunday, the sovereignty of God. He said, those, those decisions, notice what he said, is given to them for whom it is prepared. The word prepared means made ready. It's a done deal already. It's a, all, those decisions, God is, the Lord Jesus is saying, has, have already been made by my Father. It's a done deal. And I don't have the authority to change it. The sovereignty of God. Reminds me again that Ephesians 1, 4 says, I was chosen in Him before the foundation of this world. As I shared with you last Sunday, that song from the 1980s when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. No, no, no. I was on his mind a long time before the cross ever came up. Amen. Amen. So we see the request to the Savior. The Lord never rebuked or reproved this lady or her sons, James or John. I want you to look in verse 24 through 29 as we get ready to wrap things up, though. I want you to see the rebuke by the Savior. And the rebuke was not to James, John, or their mother. In verse 24, we see the irritation of the twelve. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation. They were, they were more than just a little upset. Apparently, they were disturbed and irritated about the deception of it because here, James and John and their mother had gone off and had a little private conference with Jesus. Now, when the ten hear about it, they're upset. Not only that, but they were upset with the intention that James and John would... Notice it says they were upset, moved with indignation against the two brethren. Mark clearly says they were disturbed against Peter, I mean James and John. They didn't blame the mama, they blamed James and John. They should have stood up and men and not said, no mama, we're not doing this. They were upset that they were, were trying to vie for position, as it were. Isn't it interesting how it is, how easy it is to condemn in others what we excuse in ourselves? These are the same ten that were arguing in chapter 18 over who was the greatest in the kingdom. These are the same. It, it, it's obvious. I mean, have you ever heard somebody complaining about or criticizing somebody else and you think to yourself, well, you've got the same issue in your life? Isn't it, isn't it, it's hard to see it in ourselves, isn't it? If there's anything that we're going to learn about becoming great in God's kingdom is that we're going to have to see ourselves as God himself sees us. Amen. And so he gives them this instruction on humility in verses 25 through 27. And he just basically tells them, guys, the Gentiles, they exercise dominion. And they that are great exercise. In other words, the Gentile world, the, the non-believing world climb their way to the top. And when they get there, they look down on all the little peons and they abuse and wreck and mistreat them. He said, that is not humility. That is not what's to take place. Notice what he says. He gives the immoral example of the Gentiles in verse 25, but he gives the intended example in verse 26. He said, and you need to underline this, but it shall not be so among you. You ought to be different. Ladies and gentlemen, look this way. Listen up this morning. You and I ought to set a different example for this world than the world sets for themselves. Yes, sir. Amen. Right. I know there are a few companies that prove to be exceptions, as it were. But most companies, you claw your way to the top. You get there by kicking everybody else down off, uh, from under you. I was a, a struck with some admiration for... Now, I don't know. I've never worked there. I don't know anybody now who works there. But uh, at the uh, Aflac company. But, you know, their, one of their founders wrote a book on servant leadership that I have in my office back there. And it's nothing more than what the Bible already clearly says. 
Matter of fact, Jesus said in this instruction, he gives them the illustration. He says, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Take That word minister doesn't mean preacher. That means servant. It's a word that means servant. It's the same word we use for deacons. They're to be servants in churches, not rulers in churches, not leaders in churches. They Deacons are servants in churches. And God says, the Lord Jesus says here, if you want to be great, you've got to learn to be small. If you want to be up here, you've got to learn to serve here. And because in the kingdom of God is not up and down, it's this way. Because there's one that is Lord over us, and that's him. And that's the way it works. And Jesus said it shall not be so among you. you. You ought to be different. That's the reason on your job, as you go to your job, whether you work in the military or whether you work in another, in, a bis, in, in the business world, you ought, to, you ought to have such an example about your life that you're not the one seen as trying to push everybody else down so you can bring, drag yourself up. You're the one that's more concerned about others than you are yourself. Jesus said, he that is chief among you, let him be your servant. And Jesus, by the way, when did he demonstrate that physically? What about the upper room as they went into the upper room that night for the Last Supper? And they walked in there. They'd been walking the dusty roads with their sandaled feet. And the custom of the day was that somebody was to take the basin of water and a towel as to wash the feet of everybody else. But all 12 of them were too good to wash each other's feet. They were still arguing over who was going to be the greatest. And Jesus took the towel laid aside his own robe and took the towel and wrapped it around him and took up the bowl of water and began to wash their feet. And he even washed the feet of the traitor Judas. Right. Knowing what Judas was going to do. Jesus set the example, did he not? Look again in verse 27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Verse 28 even as the Son of Man. Now get this. Now, I, I like Mark's rendering of it better. It's the same word, but turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister. And that word minister means to serve. So let me translate it this way. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Here we see in the illustration of our Savior, we see the purpose of service. Christ set the example of being the servant. Isaiah 53 prophesied him coming as a servant. Let me just read the text, Isaiah 53, verse 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord Jehovah to bruise him. He hath put him to a grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied for by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. That sounds like both Matthew and Mark. When Jesus recorded, said these words, he was repeating Matthew, Isaiah 53, 11. My servant shall justify many. He's going to give himself a ransom for many. That word ransom is the word that means to buy or to redeem. It means to exchange in place of. Can I tell you that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, you and I that day when he died there. He died as a ransom for us. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 6 says the same thing. He paid the price. And by the way, I've heard some of the old songs and some of the southern gospel songs that talk about Jesus paying the, the devil the price for my soul. I, I want you to know he did no business transaction with the devil. The de hey, I, I was part of his kingdom before I became a saved person. But the Bible says that Jesus paid God the Father the price of judgment against sin. That's how he redeemed my soul. That's how he redeemed your soul. Now, what's this all boil down to? They've been arguing over who's been the greatest. <clears throat> they were trying to climb their way to the top. They were trying to jockey for positions in the kingdom. And Jesus ultimately comes down and he says, Your life, men, is to not be one of pursuits of positions. 
but you're to be a servant like I am. Now, Paul said it this way, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath also highly exalted him and given him as the name which is above every name. Can that same humbling and exalting? Yes, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Humble your hand, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. That's the way it works. And that's what Jesus said. He said, now, as, you, as I'm doing, you are to do. That's the reason why, then, I'm to live my life, not for Marty O'Neill when. I'm to live my life for everybody else. You're not to live your life for yourself, but you're to live your life for everybody else. Now, the world teaches just the opposite. That you've got to take care of yourself. Jesus said you have to forsake yourself. You have to take up your cross. You have to follow him, and part of following him is being willing to give yourself a ransom. Have the same mind that he did. You've got to be willing to do that. Now, the details of, of this event has all been covered. What are some practical applications that we can get out of this? I want to give you three things, and with this, we'll be done. Number one application I see is that our desires are not always God's plan. They came desiring him, and he asked, what's your wish? What do you want? What are you asking for? Now, there's a verse in the Old Testament in the book of Psalm, the 37th chapter, the fourth verse. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. People misquote and misuse that verse all the time. They think that if I love God, if I serve God, then he's going to give me whatever I desire. That is not what the verse says. It says, if I love God and delight in him, he will not give me what I desire, but he will give me the desire. He will put the right desires in my heart. And I will want those things that please him and honor him. Amen. And that's what we learn here in this text here today is that our desires are not always God's plan. Number two. We learn self-promotion. Self-promotion is always a source of contention. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation. They were displeased, Mark says. Reminds us of Proverbs 13, 10. Only by pride cometh contention. So we learn that our desires are not always part of God's plan and that self-promotion always is a source of contention. And number three, get this one, you don't want to miss it. The way up is down. The way up is down. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. A.W. Tozer said this, a real Christian is an odd number anyway. He feels supreme love for one who he has never seen, talks familiarly, <laughs> familiarly every day to someone he cannot see, expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another, empties himself in order to be full, admits he is wrong so he can be declared right, goes down in order to get up, is strongest when he is weakest, richest when he is poorest, happiest when he feels the worst, he dies so he can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away so he can keep, sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, and knows that which passes knowledge. The man who has met God is not looking for anything, he has found it. He is not searching for light, for upon him the light has already shined. His certainty may, be bigot, may seem bigoted, but his assurance is that of one who knows by experience that his religion is more than mere hearsay. He is not a copy nor a facsimile. He is an original from the hand of the Holy Spirit of the living God of heaven. Amen and amen. Now let me ask you this morning. As we wrap this up, we've concluded that the way to happiness in life is to humble ourselves in service, to do it, serve Him faithfully, to rest in His sovereignty. So let me ask you a question. Are you doing that today? Are you still trying to crawl, climb, and figure your way to the top? Maybe on your job. You know, it happens a lot of time in churches. I was talking to my wife. My wife and I were eating the other night. We were... Heard, heard of some bad news this week from a former church member in another church that I used to pastor. The stage four, final days of cancer. Not many, not many days to live. I grieve. We got to talking about some of the folks that have been in that church, and 
talked about a fellow that, bless his heart, I believe he, I believe he was a, I believe he loved the Lord, but he was a source of contention because of this very thing, trying to climb his way. The only, he had no authority on the job. He had no authority in his home. And the only place he had any authority, he thought, was at church. And I thought, boy, that just kind of fits right where we're studying on this Sunday morning as the disciples. They feel like they got to climb their way up the... People think, feel like they have to do that in churches sometime. And that's the reason why I, you've heard me give the example more than once. I've pastored churches where I've been told, Pastor, you're getting too many people in our church. We, we, we got to slow this thing down. Two of our churches have had that said to me. Actually three, because it was said to me here. <laughs> Not by anybody present. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how often times do we cause ourselves grief and heartache because we are trying to push and pull and promote ourselves? Let's just rest in God and let Him to handle the rest. Maybe you're here today and you've never come to Christ for salvation. Man, you, you, if you want to be a part of God's kingdom at all, you're going to have to be saved. You can't get into heaven. You can't get into the heaven. Jesus told Nicodemus, a very religious and upright man, Except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Except you begin, be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He told him in two different ways. You not only cannot see it, you can't get into it. Well, that's where it starts. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, what a wonderful day it would be to settle that. Amen? Amen? But if you're saved, you know your way to heaven. The truth is, though, most of us, I think, are more like the ten many times. Trying to push our way through. Let's just let God control our lives. Let's bow our heads. In a moment we're going to sing page 667, Without Him I Could Do Nothing. The Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. We invite you to come this morning. Father, you know the need of hearts. I pray you'd bless, have your hand in this time of decision and invitation. Pray that, Lord, your name has been honored as we've shared your word this morning. In Jesus' precious name.